Uh, thanks, Justin. Uh, obviously, people always say I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. But uh, eight days ago, I was cycling in the, the Wicklow Hills, and my brakes failed on a nasty, wet downhill. And faced with an eight-foot stone wall, I managed to turn the bike and ended up in a ditch and only uh, tore ligaments in my wrist. So I am really delighted to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it gets uh, past Simon it. asked me to pour him a glass of water. Yeah, yeah. So my teenagers aren't here, so uh, <laughs> I, I, I have to get my crew. Um, yeah, so uh, my background is in, in, in cable and IPTV platforms. Uh, I'm now working for Three Vision, which is a boutique media consultancy out of Bath, specialising in content strategy and helping uh, clients l navigate rights in the world of OTT and, and SVOD, etc. Looking forward to today's session on our take, the panelists' take on all these mega trends that, that are uh, impacting on our industry, which is in a complete state of, of flux right now. Um, I love these media tele events. Uh, I spoke at one five years ago. If I could just pull up a slide. Uh, this was June 2013. And if I had had a spare thousand euro dollars in June 13, I'd be looking at $12,222 worth of uh, Netflix shares on, in only five years' time. So I think that's extraordinary how you have uh, the things you miss, the things you get wrong or don't anticipate. So, that's, so uh, you know, I think a lot of what we're, we're going to talk about today is a lot of companies trying to chase what's the, the, ne the Netflix effect, and we're really trying to understand wh whether all those new, the new Netflixes, whether they are really commercially sustainable. So I'd like the panel's view with a kind of jaundiced commercial eye. We're all uh, TV professionals here that uh, are, are, you know, running businesses, looking at real numbers. And I'm really interested in the panel's view on how sustainable all these new services are and how it's all going to wash out. So um, I'd like to get explore Again, your, your view on the commercial sustainability of these services, the different, rev, the different business models between subscription and, and ad-funded, and within that, the different variants, how broadcasters are responding to those, uh, the threats of these global players, and uh, how in, in, in their day-to-day -day businesses, how they're going to experiment, as Christina, Christina said, how we're going to... Uh, uh, experiment, fail, fail again, and how we're going to evolve to uh, combat the, the changes through the ecosystem. So, getting to my list, um, we, t we heard uh, Apple yesterday. So, uh, ladies first, Roma, in terms of all of these new services, uh, you, you run the, as we go through this maybe, just to give a quick one-liner as to your, your background, where you're coming from. But in terms of these new services, uh, what's your take on these? Do you think uh, they're commercially sustainable? Will consumers uh, spend money on multiple SVOD services or AVOD services? Thanks, Simon. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Roma Kojima. I manage the CBC GEM service, which is the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation's D2C uh, OTT video play in the English services market in Canada. And to your question, um, it's a big question, and I think that the, the first thing to look at really is, it's not about threats or comp the really, the, the zero sum game is attention, right? So it's not so much about competitive forces coming and going. Every industry, and this one is no different, has, has these waves of competitive forces. These ones have very deep pockets. But at the end of the day, you know, we're, we're also working with them in some cases. So it's kind of a case by case thing. It's not as cut and dry as a competition where somebody wins and somebody loses. Most services, and, and definitely CBC included, works um, in, in a co-pro environment. So we've produced things in, in collaboration with Netflix. Um, we have content on Netflix. We work with some of these other services as well in different capacities. So it's not so much about who's going to win or lose, at the end of the day, we do, it, it helps the, the competition grow, but it also helps the, the user 
get a wider scale of offering and benefit. That said, um, it's, 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 it's tough to say. We live in the, you know, the North American market is a little bit different, the cane market specifically from the uh, EMEA markets, for example. So there's a bigger stack OTT wise. Our cable subscriptions tend to be more expensive as do our um, mobile phone packages. Canada is probably the most expensive country in the world or one of them in terms of your uh, broadband and your, uh, uh, your mobile phone data costs. So OTT services and the stacking of them, the combination of free and uh, paid SVOD is uh, fairly high. I think the last stat I saw, the average households play closer to two and a half to three services versus the 1.1, 1.5 that we saw in uh, Simon's presentation this morning. So I think there's, there's a decent amount of room in that market to play. So I'm less worried. I think it's gonna start to get really interesting and some of those intersects between these various players and between these models are gonna start to evolve in the next couple of years. Pat, maybe um, just to take on a consumer's perspective, how many discrete subscriptions do you think an average European user will have for these services? Well, look, for, firstly, I'm Pat Kiley, Managing Director of Virgin Media Television, I, which is, I guess, an Irish headquartered business, which is, a, the, I guess, a, the unique position when we talk about the, the, the either or options here. We're sitting right in the middle of it, I, I think, because we're the free, the leading free tier broadcaster in Ireland. So essentially, we're the ITV of Ireland. We're owned by Virgin Media UK and Ireland as a collective, so the leading cable business which is owned by Liberty Global and not insignificant investor in, in content and production businesses. So, so from, from that perspective, I guess, you know, we, you know, to Roma's point, we're sitting nicely, probably in, Mike Freeze called it an experiment. I, I, I said that sounded painful. I think I'd, I'd like to call it a case study, but we're, we're, <laughs> we're, 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 we're looking at it from both the perspective of where things are gonna go with, with content at the heart, you know, not to, not to, not to go back to the old, content is king cliche, but content is at the heart of everything we do, and we'll follow the eyeballs and follow the trends, and that will sometimes be the big global collaboration we've done with Netflix. So within Ireland, a lot of people thought that we, as, again, the leading free tier broadcaster in Ireland, would have had a big issue with Virgin Media signing up to the global, Liberty Global carriage arrangements with Netflix. Netflix. But we recognized immediately that it was working for us to keep a Netflix user in the EPG environment, because all of our customers now, and we can see it through the numbers, they all view Netflix through channel 300. So when you watch Virgin Media 1, which is in channel 103, you just press two, three digits on your remote control and get down there. So, so the coexistence, it's, you know, our, our view very much is it, it's not an either or. As to, as to the growth of you know, net, Netflix, the growth of Netflix custom, we believe is a positive, not a negative. It's a growth, growth factor for television because it's another use of the box, and we know how powerful that is in terms of bringing viewers who we may have lost into other devices actually back to the traditional, traditional core. And, and again, as Roma said, we're, we're content at the heart. We have a lot of collaboration, a lot of work that we're doing in terms of Ireland becoming a content centre and using the, the power of free to air to, to fund and produce content and through our family, I'll, I'll be telling that story a little bit later, I'm doing a little piece on just the Virgin Media Television Ireland story about rebranding a free terror business as Virgin Media Television. And within that, there's a fantastic content story, I think, and examples of you know commissioning big drama series like Blood, which Channel 5 acquired for this market, and how it is now in 60 different markets and acquired by Acorn uh, for the United States. So I think does the return path uh, business there as well from a content perspective. Yeah, it, it is certainly an opportunity with these having global players means it is an opportunity if you create great content you get fantastic reach for it. Hi Jean-Marc, we didn't manage to uh, meet or pre the session. Um, just two questions, one following on uh, from Pat's point uh, but firstly with all these new services Disney Plus, Apple etc, you, your take on um, in terms of consumers' viewing time and their share of wallet, how many, again, that question, how many services do you think a typical subscriber will, will to subscribe to in a bundle? How, how far, how big can this get? I think, you know, the, the, we're at a fascinating time where there is a lot of rush to create these direct-to-consumer services. And, you know, you could, tell that, you could say there is a bit of a speculative bubble. 
Uh, so as a consumer, you're sort of flooded with all these potential offers. You know, I would start dividing the average ARPU per country that you pay to pay TV by the average price of uh, these SVOD services. So if it's 10 euro, 10 dollars, 10 pounds, you know, will households start buying six, seven, eight, 10, 15 of these? Or will they go through uh, a pay TV bundle that will start aggregating content and providing uh, entertainment experience through the aggregation exercise, as well as value through the commercial bundle? Uh, so there is no doubt that there is consumer appetite for these services. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's demonstrated, you know, we talk a lot about the next week's investment in content. Uh, at the same time, you know, when you take a look at the Netflix investment in technology, you realize how complicated it is to actually go and do these services. Uh, so certainly uh, at Cine Media, we, we do fantastic uh, conference lanyards. Uh, we happen to also do TV technology and, and work with these uh, pay TV and OTT provider. Um, and we certainly see uh, the two going in the same direction and the two meeting each other, you know, pure OTT on the one end and pay TV on the other end to create a new bundle that will certainly be appealing to uh, consumers. Are you seeing, um, uh, I call them traditional, although I hate the word, word traditional in this context, but uh, traditional pay TV cable satellite providers bundling in Netflix and other subscriptions in, in kind of a la carte instead of linear channels, are you seeing them bundling it into their into their, yeah, it's absolutely their commercial happening. bundle? I mean, the, the, the Sky Netflix deal was a bit of a landmark. Uh, of you know, a major pay TV company cutting a deal with a major OTT vendor and bringing the content onto the platform. Uh, it's obvious that the time it takes for an SVOD service to reach critical mass is important because they are spending the money on content, they don't get the revenue. How long can you afford to be in the red? Uh, you know, and Netflix survival is only due to its ability to raise debt to finance its growth, right? And all of a sudden, when you look at this challenge and you face pay TV companies, that have millions of subscribers to offer, it's a fast route to market. And I would say this is probably going to accelerate as you see historical media companies like Disney, NBCU, who are entering the SVOD market. Their natural distribution channel are the pay TV companies. So there is no doubt you're going to see more of these deals because at the end of the day, they help each other. One has subscriber mass and has a distribution platform. The other one has the service. So there is a way of working, working together. So this, over to you, Dan. Um, this is a question that I, uh, fascinates me. Uh, uh, how, you're looking at someone like Disney Plus, talking about going direct to consumers, yet at the same time it has a huge dis revenue model from distribution and carriage fees from multiple platforms. How do they square the circle? What, what's it like inside those uh, carriage renewal meetings when they're expecting pay TV platforms to continue to pay subscription uh, carriage fees, yet at the same time they're being undermined by direct-to-consumer competitors. Mm. I mean, that, how, how is Viacom's approach to managing both sides of the revenue line? Mm. So, so I guess we look at the, the UK market and we see, um, we see it's going through a period of unbundling. If you look at Sky, it's sort of, it's taken some of its extended basic tiers out and it's now got box sets, HD kids. Um, if you look across the market, all the kids, the kids channels are added in their own separate bundles now, so that's fully unbundled. Um, but at the same time, there's a process of rebundling going on. You know, Netflix and Sky and Virgin, BT Sport and Sky, Now TV and BT, Amazon Prime and BT. So there's this re-aggregation going on. Um, so from Viacom's point of view, I should say, sorry, I'm Dan from Viacom. Viacom has Channel 5, public service broadcaster here in the UK, but also Comedy Central, MTV and Nickelodeon brands. Um, so from our point of view, we step back from all that transition or change, and we think fundamentally the pay model has a real health about it still. That aggregation model is very, very healthy. Uh, so when we think about what D2C opportunities there are for Viacom, uh, there's two frames we look through. One is, is there, an audience, is there an audience need for this? Is there a way we can get to an audience that we're not currently doing today? And the second one is, how can this bring benefits to our partnerships? Because that's for us where the future is. So. That's how we see it. I think Disney, um, I can't talk to their strategy, but they've got um, a different business ecosystem. They're probably seeing, seeing this stack up slightly differently, but uh, certainly for us, um, our partnerships uh, are, are paramount for us, and um, we're investing more in pay TV today than we ever have done. Good. Uh, and finally to Brad, um, from, with your perspective at, at Comcast, 
uh, obviously multiple markets. Do you, do you see that the US example where cable bills are $100 plus, is that a, a valid uh, template to drag and drop into EMEA markets or are we different? Um, Brad Levine, GM for International uh, to Comcast Technology Solutions. Um, just very briefly, we provide solutions based on our software as a service um, platform to operators, broadcasters, content holders uh, across the world. We help them monetize and, and deliver digital video content to, to their users. Um, I don't think that the US model necessarily lifts and, and shifts very easily. Um, the US is a homogenous market. It's um, kind of you know divided up by regulation. And if you own a particular area, that's who you deliver to and, and you, you have a captive audience. We're seeing more and more um, disaggregation here in terms of, of availability of, of service. And I think that that will continue to, to drive the, the landscape here for us in, in, in not just in Europe, but uh, across the, the rest of, of the world where, where we've got um, very different ARPU models. If you look at India with over a, a, you know, a billion um, population who are very hungry for content, they're never going to look to you know, $10 a month, let, let alone $100 a month. But because of the size of the market, uh, the definitely distinct opportunities there for um, for, for content provision to, to still be, um, you know, revenue generating. So, yeah, thank you. And so on to the revenue questions. Um, Roma, you've got an interesting service in Canada with a mixture of revenue models. Do you want to give us, give sure. the audience a view? Yeah, uh, so I'm going to get into it actually a little bit later as well, but just at a high level, the way we've set up the CBC GEM service model is actually a hybrid membership uh, based on a tier system. So we have actually an AVOD and an SVOD model that we use. Uh, part of that comes from the fact that uh, the CBC is, is public, public service. And so we are mandated from the Canadian Broadcasting Act as well as our, our CBC mandates to uh, allow for a, a, a whole chunk of video content essentially to be available for free bunny years. You walk by a, a Best Buy and you look at the TVs and, and that's what you should be able to see. Uh, and then what we have also done is we basically added that tier system uh, with some very clear transactional values to make up for the fact that, first of all, we're not purely driven by ARPU and revenue. That's, that's not what we're here to do. Uh, but because of the way we're funded and because of this public service mandate, we've added essentially a premium layer uh, to the service as well, which is really set up as a feature. It's not. Uh, a separate, there's value propositions at the feature level, but it's not a separate offering. Uh, and we don't, in fact, paywall video on demand content at all. So what you're really paying for is, as, a, as a user is, is the feature set. That said, though, we're still in the same competitive markets as the big players. We're competing for those advertising dollars because we do have to do a rev gen. And so it's finding that balance between the, reaching the audiences in a way that's meaningful to them, delivering on this mandate, as I said, but also finding that advertiser value and being able to connect those dots in a sustainable model. That's really, that, that's kind of the balance we're, we're looking for every single day. So from a revenue model standpoint, I think these things are evolving. I don't think we're probably the only player by far that's, that's looking at these hybrid models, but it's, it's the one that's working for us in our market at this point. Very good. And in terms of uh, evolving advertising models uh, over to Pat, uh, within the Virgin Media UK and Ireland group, I think Pat runs the, the centre of excellence in terms of uh, addressable advertising across the group. So uh, you, you've been teasing me about some announcement later on, Pat. Um, do you want to give us a, a yeah, heads up? I, well, maybe to be clear, the, obviously Virgin Media Television Ireland is uh, within that. We, we, we have a business called Virgin Media Solutions, which is our ad sales house, or Sky Media, if you like, of, of, of Virgin Media. And that would represent about 40% now commercial impact. So if there's anybody from RTE who wants to shout down to say it's 38.9 or something, that's fair enough. But it's, a, it's as close to 40%. Um, which is quite significant, and that gives us a lot of power in, in, in Ireland. We're, we're, you know, we're a big deal in what is a relatively small market, and I think it's a great opportunity for major Virgin Media as a business to use that competency in the UK market and turn what's, what's still a relatively small business for us in terms of, of ad sales 
and drive that. And a big part of that is what we'll be announcing later on today is the launch date of our addressable partnership with Sky, um, which will go live uh, this summer. So that's a, that's a big step adding initially that our 4 million homes to the 7 million Sky homes to really drive scale and, and drive the momentum of AdSmart. So that's, that's one way we're driving the model of Virgin Media UK, even without the broadcasting presence or a significant content presence at this point, shows up in the, in the ad market. So using data, our box data. So how, you know, with, with Fang taking something like 85% of all digital ad revenue, how can cable and satellite offer an alternative? Well, I guess the, way, the best way to describe it is how we're looking at it within the Irish business where we're, we're, we've got what we call the foot in both camps. And it's a lovely place to be. When I talked to analysts, and we were previously held by private equity, so believe me, I, I like when I be able to talk to analysts and be able to say we're essentially hedged, which we are, because in the free-to-air side of the business, we'll still fight the, fight the fight against our principal competitors like RTE, the state broadcaster. Uh, who, who also sell ads, by the way, so we, we compete against the BBC that sells advertising, so that's, uh, that's a challenge for us in the market. But we, uh, you know, we fight that fight, but in, in the Virgin Media world now, we have this opportunity to be able to increasingly look at the narrow cast opportunities, and the power comes with the combo, because if anybody can call at what point, you know, the, 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 things move, you know, as Simon said earlier, where, you know, what was it, five minutes or five days into the, 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 the multi-year journey. So uh, what we're, we're, we're beautifully placed to be able to say, look, we're, we're, we're playing in both spaces. And the power of that from an advertiser perspective is huge because if in one transaction, a big brand can continue to have the power of the, the broadcast and the powerful reach of broadcast, but at the same time, talk to an individual and send a discreet message off the back of that brand message and do the narrow cast targeted message. That's a, that's a great place to be. So, you know, locally we're, we're, we're watching it very closely. So certain content, you know, is moving very much towards, towards narrow cast. So we can see that, you know, going consumption of VOD for certain content and we'll go with that. And I think I said it earlier, we'll follow the eyeballs. And if we follow the eyeballs, the money follows the eyeballs. So we're, we're in the right place, but it's, it, it, you know, the mix of the content side of the business and then the cable subscriber side of the business is an interesting one because obviously our cable revenues and our, you know, our, 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 you know, high margin, but our relative contribution to content TV is a low margin business um, f for us. So really for us, it's about not just in terms of monetizing our content and funding, funding our content. Yes, some of it is about managing that foot and boat camps of broadcast versus narrowcast. But there's also the third part of the, the triangle for us, which is how are we using our content to drive our cable business and our connectivity business? I think we, this is, this, we, if we get time to it, we, you've got some exclusive content for your cable business, which we'll, come, we'll touch on later on. Mm. Dan, uh, talking about uh, broadcast TV or live TV, wh where's your view on where linear is at now? Yeah, I think um, a, a helpful way to look at linear is to look at it through a genre lens. So different genres have you know, different performance in linear. For us, um, you know, MTV is a major reality youth brand in this market. Um, shows like Love Island on IFV2, but Geordie Shaw, X on the Beach on our channels, um, still have a very resilient linear audience. And MTV has held its linear share over 2018 at the same time as growing its VOD usage substantially. And I think that's because that genre of programming is really suited to a, a very current social conversation. You need to see it in the moment, if not in the moment, in close proximity to it. So, I think for certain genres, um, linear is still very healthy, and certainly what a lot of the work Viacom does um, around youth and reality, it's still a very important and vibrant part of our offer. You know, if you're looking at something like premium scripted drama or something that's got a longer fuse, the conversation with that can run a longer time. Perhaps that's less suited to, um, you know, perhaps perhaps it's more suited to on demand. Um, so yeah, I think I think for us, um, linear is still very healthy around certain types of programs. Um, it's, you know, we see a big future for it still. Yeah, thanks. If we could just roll on to the, the next slide, please. So we're talking about collaboration. This is from 2007. <laughs> uh, after detail and careful consideration, we've decided that this joint venture will be too much of a threat to competition in this developing market and has to be stopped down with that sort of thing, as we say in Ireland. That's from 2009, the Competition uh, Authority judgment. Uh, and you know, this, we've all seen the announcement about BritBox 
Um, Dan, uh, I know with, with your Channel 5 hat, um, you're, you're close to the discussions on BritBox. Uh, what's your take on it? Yeah, we, uh, we're, we're very supportive of it. We're talking with ITV about it. Um, I know there's, there's different views on the need for it, but um, fundamentally, I think in the UK, there's a huge appetite for British programming. Uh, you look at the top, I think Enders did a study of the top 2,000 titles on TV last year, and uh, there were only three or four titles that were not British, and they were films. Um, it's a huge appetite for British programming. Um, Channel 5 produced a lot of this great program on the fact and side. We won Channel of the Year last year for the Edinburgh TV Awards off the back of uh, cruising with Jay McDonald that, that was awarded at BAFTA. We've got all this great programming, as has the BBC ITV Channel 4, um, and to present it together in, a, in an environment like BritBox probably takes a lot of the friction out of it for those homes that really want to get access to that programming. So, um, yeah, I think there's a, there is a segment for some of the great British programming to come together in a frictionless, on-demand environment that will probably complement Netflix, complement Amazon Prime, uh, sit alongside them. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Roma, do, do, do you see um, uh, a role where local broadcasters will club together and to maybe not compete against Netflix, but offer a, a similar service to cater for that type of viewing? Um, I think there's a lot of possibility. I mean, we're, there's open conversations all over the place. What those shape up to be, and you know, there's broadcasters like like us, like the CBC, that are obviously very focused on one specific market because that's that's how we're set up to do. Uh, but that leaves uh, we're also you know massive prolific content producers, uh, and we work very closely with a whole bunch of uh, folks that are creating some really really interesting content which ties to, and we're mandated to do that as well because I know that it's relatively new in, in, in this market, in these markets, but uh, we have something called the CanCon requirements, which in Canada is, a, if you talk 30% here, 30, 35%, we're actually closer to 60%. So we're mandated to have, depending on whether it's prime time or not, 55 to 60%, CBC is 60% of our content offering, particularly in prime time, has to be CanCon. So we're working very, very closely with these producers, and so there are opportunities that start to open up when you start to extend beyond your, your home market for this great content, especially from our perspective, which is that it's primarily driven with English, speak, uh, English language as well as uh, francophone, and therefore we have a lot of opportunities there. Uh, Simon talked about uh, you know, local rivalries and uh, preventing people really working together. Dan, do you see a big clash of egos in the UK space around this, or is there a, a degree of maturity now? Uh, we're certainly not, not seeing that. I think there's a, a realisation um, about, you know, what's the best way to surface this deep library of programme that you've got. Um, probably the, the tension, to the extent there is any, is in how to manage the windowing with your existing services, and you've seen that with the iPlayer and and uh, and you know ITV will be looking at the same thing. So there's a there's a windowing question. Um, that's probably the main challenge for that sort of partnership. I don't think there's any real competitive tension in the SVOD space between them at the moment. So uh, uh, there's one kind of elephant in the room. I don't know what a baby elephant <coughs> is called. Um, um, piracy. <laughs> So all us industry professionals blithely making the next plan and 25 to 30 percent of people actually taking all the content for free. Um, Jean-Marc, do you think the industry is, 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 is sleepwalking around piracy or is there people taking it seriously? Well, I think the, the well, certainly historically pay TV who nearly died in the 90s of piracy, they're taking it seriously. So we can take that for granted. The sort of new world, the OTT world, is discovering the joy of subscription services, the money gets in every month, and we, as these gain scale, they will discover the joy, of, the joy of piracy. The interesting thing is, you've got pay TV going towards advertising, you've got free-to-air that used to do advertising going towards subscription, so at the end of the day, there is a growing number of subscription TV services in the world, and these will need to be protected. Uh, interestingly, uh, we announced at CES uh, a solution called Credential Sharing Insights, which allows to detect how you're using your uh, TV platform and if you're sharing your login password with your friends. Uh, that got extreme coverage, uh, and it got extreme coverage because a lot of people are actually doing it. 
Uh, and, and that shows that there is loss of revenue, which you would classify as sort of casual piracy, but there is loss of revenue in a market where making money is extremely difficult. So there is certainly a potential there for service providers to recoup their content investment through controlling who is sharing their password. And at, at the other end of the spectrum is actual you know, fraud and piracy of people that are making a living out of it. Uh, which is a very widespread industry. In some countries, you actually have more pirate subscription than a legitimate subscription. So there is little doubt in our mind that securing the content as it goes OTT, it, it's going to have to be done. You know, otherwise, there won't be business uh, for anybody there. So uh, we're wrapping up. Uh, but like the House of Commons today, we're, we're going to take an indicative vote about the future direction of our, of our industry. So, uh, starting with Brad, who's your ultimate winner and loser in, over the next five years in, in, uh, in this space? I think that because we're inside the industry, we don't always ask the right questions. There was a very good presentation on that earlier. I think that when, from a revenue perspective, we don't necessarily, or we shouldn't chase eyeballs, right? We should chase dollars. Uh, the, the, the industry is seeing some very interesting influences amazon apple have entered the race i think disney aren't just a content organization disney are, are a consumer organization i think if you look at those three uh, they are driving a much bigger landscape ecosystem infrastructure than just content and they are the ones that are, i think will have the financial strength and also the market insight because they know what we buy, when we buy it, what we watch um, and what to sell to us. And I, I think those those are, are going to be the, you know, the, 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 the ultimate likely winners rather than people who are just focused on specific content. Netflix can't sell you anything other than another month subscription. Excellent answer. Dan, where do you see it? Yeah. Um, of course, there's no, no guarantees for any winners, but I guess if you create, create and own your own programming and your own content and you can forge great partnerships, that's, you know, that's going to put you in a good place uh, for five years' time. Sean Mark? I would say we're going to be the winners, we the consumers. We're going to have great content coming from many, many sources, which we enjoy on all screens. You know, happy days. <laughs> uh, we, we haven't mentioned the people who make the content, the, the, the producers, they must be making out like bandits. <laughs> a pass? Yeah, I was going to say rights holders, IP, yeah. but I think, I think businesses with scale, relevance, and then I think agility to, to, to move, because we can't really call it just yet. Roman? Would it be blindly optimistic to say the audience actually is the winner here? We, we allow for so much more choice. We allow for so much more in terms of how you consume the content. So I think and also, I'm legally allowed to, supposed to say that, so that's my job. But uh, no, I think the audience is ultimately going to yeah. win. I think the folks that don't win, though, are the ones um, that, that aren't nimble, that don't find new ways to adapt their model and adapt how they work to these, to these new competitive forces. If you don't, whether that's through collaboration, whether that's through finding a whole new model or a new niche, I think that's, that's probably the biggest risk. OK, really interesting. Thank you very much, Pamela. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much.